Well, this is the last week that we're doing this series of messages, getting through what you're going through. And today I want to look at a topic called Never Waste Your Pain. Now, most people waste the pain and the suffering that they go through. Many folks don't profit from their problems. They don't harvest their hurts. They don't advance from their adversity. They don't learn from their losses. They don't improve from their injuries. But I want you to look at what Paul says here. If you have your outlines uh, or your bulletin, open up to the outline. Look at what Paul says here in Galatians 3, 4. He says, have you gone through all this for nothing? Is it really all for nothing? Now, when I look at that verse... I want to ask, and I want you to answer in your mind, have you grown from your pain? Or have you wasted your pain? Are you further down the road because of your adversity? Or are you in the same spot you've always been? God never wants you to waste your pain. He wants you to grow from it. And he wants you to use it to benefit other people. Now, how? How does God want us to work that out? I want to spend some time talking about that the rest of the message. So let's look at some ways we can use the struggles, the difficulties, the sufferings, the pain that we experience in our lives. And all of us do. All of us fit into that category from time to time. How can we use it? Well, one way is you can use your pain to draw closer to God. You can use your struggles, your difficulties, to draw closer to God. When anything bad happens in your life, folks, you have a choice. You can either run away from God or you can run to God. Now, sometimes, almost instinctively, we turn to God in pain. Think about some of the mass tragedies that have gone on even this past year. Bombs explode, people are shot, there are fires like there were in California, there are floods like there have been in different parts of our nation, maybe a terrorist attack. When, when that happens, when people get interviewed, and even, even yourself sometimes may respond, when that happens, there are three words that come out of people's mouths. Oh, my God. It's just instinctive. They're looking to someone bigger than themselves. The first person people cry to when they're going through difficulties is God. But some people turn away from God, and run from him. Have you ever done that? God, no thank you. I don't need your help. I don't appreciate you putting me here. I don't want to be in this situation. I'll take care of this myself. I don't need you. I'll figure out a way. Some people turn from God and run from God. Well, how do you draw close to God in your pain? How, how do you do that? Well, we've talked about that the last five weeks. You can tell God how you feel. You cry out to God. You argue with God. You trust God. The things we've been talking about. In shock, you express your shock to God. In sorrow, you cry out in your sorrow to God. In struggle, you argue argue with God. And in surrender, you let go and trust God. You take all of those steps. That's how you deal with the pain of difficulties. In your life. Look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said this. We were crushed and overwhelmed. And saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. Why? For then we put everything into the hands of God who alone could save us, and he did help us. Circle that phrase in those verses, but that was good. Paul says, wait a minute, 
We were crushed. We were overwhelmed. We were in over our heads. We were ready to give up. We were discouraged. We were defeated. We were dying. But he says that was good. Why? Because it drew him closer to God. How many people do you know have come to Christ out of pain? Maybe you did. Maybe there was a divorce. Maybe there was a death. A disaster. Maybe it was a distraction, a difficulty. Maybe it was an extreme disappointment. And God says, one of the things I can use this for in your life is that I will draw you closer to me if you will let me. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I am glad, not because it hurt you, but because the pain turned you to God. We can let pain draw us closer to the one who loves us the most. There's another way you can use your pain. And that is use it to draw closer to others. To other people. If you allow it, pain will deepen your love for other people. It will mature your love. Suffering sensitizes you. It deepens you. Suffering transforms you. The deepest level of love is the fellowship of suffering. The only way, to, only way you get to the fellowship of suffering is by being willing to be vulnerable and sharing what you feel with other people. Sometimes we don't like to do that. We don't like to share. We don't like to become vulnerable. We don't like to expose ourselves to people around us. We want to continue to pretend like we have everything. It's all together. I've got control of this. When inside, we're, we're just dying. God says, use your pain to draw closer to other people. It amazes me. It amazes me when people share their testimony about something they went through, something they're struggling with, something that happened to them. It amazes me when I talk to all the other people in church. They come to me and they'll say, Pastor, I went through the same thing. Pastor, I'm struggling with the very same thing. And I'm like, why don't, why don't you share that? I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you can't name me one thing that was painful in your life or that you struggled with or are struggling with. I guarantee you there's not one thing that you've been through that at least one or more other people in this room today haven't been through as well. I guarantee it. We need to hook up with them. We need to talk with them. Have you ever thought when you have shared something and you found somebody else who went through the same thing, have you ever thought, wow, I thought I was the only one, and I'm not? That's how other people will feel when you open up and share your pain with them. Use your pain to draw closer to others. Look what Paul said in Galatians 6 two. By helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. Now, what's the law of Christ? Jesus said that we are to love your neighbor as, our, as yourself. You love your neighbor as yourself. So when you help others in your pain, when you help each other in your troubles, when you enter into the fellowship of suffering, he says, then you're obeying the greatest commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. Folks, pain in your life, if you will allow it, pain will teach you how to really love others. Real love 
changes bedpans. It bandages emotional and spiritual and physical wounds. Real love works. And you can use your pain to draw draw closer to God and also then to draw closer to other people. You need that. You may think you don't, but you do. You say, oh, Kevin, I, I thought all I needed was God. But God says you need other people too. Number three, you can also use your pain to become more like Jesus. Pain is always an opportunity to grow in character. It's an opportunity to grow in the fruit of the Spirit, in in love and joy and peace, patience and kindness and gentleness, in goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. How do you learn them? You learn them through tough times. Some people let pain make them bitter, but some people allow pain to make them better. Some people let pain be a stepping stone to progress. Others let pain become a stumbling block to failure. It's a choice that you make. The fact is, and I said this last week, let's see if you remember. Now, I know you don't. Pastors, we're taught when we, we go to cemetery, seminary, <laughs> we're taught that the average church member will forget 90% of what you said by Wednesday. I cry every Wednesday. <laughs> but I said this last week. But for you, it's going to sound new. God's number one purpose in your life and in my life, in any believer's life, God's number one purpose is to do what? Make you like, fill in the last part, Jesus, right? His number one purpose in your life isn't to bless you, isn't to make things easy for you. It's to make you like his son, Jesus Christ. And if God's going to make you like Jesus, if he's going to make you loving like Jesus, if he's going to make you think like Jesus, if he's going to make you be kind like Jesus, to be truthful like Jesus, to have the character, the integrity, the generosity, and the humility of Jesus... If God's going to make you like Jesus, he's going to take you through the same things that Jesus went through himself. Only when you go through those things will you learn how to become more like Jesus. And Paul compliments the way the Corinthians had handled the pain in their lives. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul said, now, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? You are more alive. You're more concerned. You are more sensitive. You are more reverent. You are more human. You are more passionate, more responsible. Looked at from any angle You've come out of this with purity of heart. Paul is talking to a group of people who had just gone through extreme difficulty. Their life had literally been a hell on earth. They'd gone through incredible persecution, amazing suffering, extreme pain. And Paul says there are seven things that have come out of this. You're more alive. You're more concerned. You're more sensitive. You're more relevant, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Wouldn't you like to be like that? Wouldn't you like to be more concerned, more sensitive, more alive, more human, more relevant, more passionate, more responsible? I hope so. And in order to do that, you've got to let God use the painful things in your life.
So you ask God, God, use it. Use the painful things in my life to make me more alive, more human, more responsible, more compassionate, more humble. God, use them to make me more like Jesus. And you ask them, and then you choose to cooperate. The fact is, folks, pain transforms us. It never leaves us where we started. It won't leave you where it picks you up. It will take you to another place. The choice is, are you going to go closer to God or away from God? If you want to win in life, if you want to succeed in life, if you want your life to have meaning and significance, you need to let God use the difficulties to change you. Now, one of the secrets of being a winner, whether it's winning in business or winning in sports, winning in love or in relationships or financially or spiritually or any other way, one of the secrets of being a winner is the, it can be found, one of the secrets can be found in, in this word. It's the word resilience. Resilience. Resilience is the ability to overcome challenges of all kinds. Trauma, tragedy, personal crisis, plain old life problems. It's the ability to overcome those things and bounce back stronger, wiser, and more personally powerful. That's what resilience is. It doesn't mean you don't go through the valley. It means eventually you let God use it to bring you back up better than you were when you were down there. You need resilience. I want to show you two pictures. Look at this picture of this tree. It's pretty incredible. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like you thought your life was rooted and grounded and all of a sudden the, the bottom is just taken away and you are just barely hanging on? Do you ever feel like that? I'm looking at this tree and I'm going, but at least it's hanging on, right? It's not giving up its ground. Something was taken from it. But it has resilience. Folks, when the very foundation of your life seems like it was just washed away from underneath of you and you felt like you were standing on all of this stuff that was stable and all of a sudden it's gone, you need to be resilient and hang on. Let me show you one more picture. Talk about resilience. I love this. You see that? Is that a little dandelion thing? When people lay asphalt roads, they, they spray oil on the ground first, usually, and it gets a, a little solid foundation. It kills everything that's there. Then on top of that oil, they put anywhere from four to six inches of asphalt that's compounded down so tight. It's just incredible. Look at this thing. Right up from the bottom, all the way up through that. Have you ever seen that happen? It's incredible. That little dandelion has resilience. Nothing's going to stop it. Nothing's going to get in its way. It was pounded down. It had no chance, and it came through. I want that on my team. It pushed back. It bounced back. It flourished again. Why do we need to be resilient? Because everybody goes through tough times. Everybody has failures. Everybody has flops in their lives. Nobody goes through life with unbroken success. Nobody goes through life with no problems or no grief or no pain. The difference between winners and losers is that winners get back up. They have resilience. They keep on keeping on. If you have resilience, you learn from your losses, you profit from your pain, you advance from your adversity. 
How do you get resilience? You do what Paul did. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians this time in chapter 4. He says, for this reason, we never become discouraged. Even though our physical being is gradually decaying. Can I get a personal amen on that? Oh, my goodness. Even though our physical being is gradually decaying, yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. Listen, sometimes you wake up and you don't feel like you've been spiritually renewed the day before or that night. And you don't feel real spiritually renewed that morning. Listen to me. The promise of God is that your spiritual being in, in, inside of you, it's being renewed whether you feel it or not. Whether you sense it or not, you're being spiritually renewed. That's what Paul says here. Day after day, you're being renewed. God is not finished with you. He hasn't given up on you. Let's continue on. And these temporary troubles we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory. Much greater than the trouble. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. So what's the secret of Paul's resilience? His determination, his ability to bounce back no matter how bad things happened in his life. Paul's secret to resilience was this. You find it in this verse or these verses. It was his perspective. Paul was resilient because he had a right perspective. It was the way he looked at things. He looked at life not from a worldly view, but from a godly view. Not from a contemporary view, but from an eternal perspective. He looked at his life in light of eternity, realizing that his life is just preparation for the next life when we get to heaven with God. And no matter how hard the problem is, it really is just temporary. You say, Pastor, I've, been the, I, I've had the same problem. I've had the same struggle for five, six, seven years, for 10 years. I've had it for 40 or 50 years. I've had it for 60 years. I hear you, and I'm not happy about that at all. I wish it would go away. I pray for people's healing all the time, and I pray for instant healing that the Holy Spirit brings. If God doesn't want to do it that way, I pray for healing through medicine. I, I pray for people to be healed, but sometimes it doesn't happen, and people struggle, and they suffer. Sometimes their entire lives, born that way. And I'm not making light of that one little bit. But I will say, 40, 50, 60, 90 years compared to eternity isn't even a blink in time. Paul didn't deny the struggles he went through. He just kept things in perspective. This is temporary. It feels like forever, but compared to heaven, it's really a short period of time. So I'm not trying to teach you to ignore what you're going through or to deny it. Not at all. I'm just saying let's get a good perspective on it. Folks, you can handle unbelievable pain if you see a purpose in it, if you see God's hand in it, if you see God using it to draw you closer to him, if you see God using it to teach you to love other people, if you see God using it to make you more like Christ, then you get resilience. Now, I don't know what's discouraging you today. It may be a physical problem. Maybe it's a financial problem. Maybe it's a relational problem. There are some things that are prolonged pain in your life, and it just doesn't seem like they're going away, and you feel like you're in a tunnel. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're discouraged, and you feel like giving up. Use your pain 
let God use your pain to make you more like Jesus. Now, quite frankly, folks, sometimes if it's painful situations that make us more like Jesus, I really don't want to become more like Jesus. Because sometimes the pain is that hard. Would you agree? But we need to trust him. We need to say, whatever, God. We sing a song here. I kind of like it and I kind of don't. But I don't dictate the music to Jason. He does a pretty good job, doesn't he? Him and the band do a great job. But we sing a song here. Yeah, you can always give them a hand. They're incredible. We sing a song here, and I don't, don't have it memorized, but it's something about if, if the rain, if the struggles make me more like Jesus, then bring on the rain. Don't we sing a song like that here? You know, let it rain, let it rain. You know, part of me loves that song, and I sing it, then part of me doesn't sing it the rest of the song. Because it's hard. It's hard. Number four. You can use your pain to help others. You can use it to connect with others, but you can also use it to help others. This is called redemptive suffering. It's suffering for the benefit of others. It's the highest and best use of your pain. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, God comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort others. Just underline that. You want to know why God comforts you in troubles so that you can comfort others. Then, when others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. You can be sure that the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. So when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your benefit and salvation. For when God comforts us, it is so that we, in turn, can be an encouragement to you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. God lets you go through stuff. You struggle through stuff. You go through your pain. You go through your difficulty. And then God says, now you know what that's like. Now I'm going to send you to somebody who's gone through the same thing, and you're going to help them. That's what God wants you to do. Think about it. Who can better help a struggling veteran than somebody who's been a veteran himself or herself? Who could better help parents of special needs children than somebody who had a special needs child? Who can better help somebody struggling with a chronic illness than somebody who's been struggling with an illness for years, maybe decades? They, they understand. Who can better help someone who's lost a loved one than someone who's lost a loved one themselves? So God wants you to help other people who are going through similar or the same situations that you're going through. Some of you have struggled and suffered, and God sent somebody who went through the same thing you are going through. God sent them to you to help you, and I guarantee you it made you feel better. If nothing else, you just were going, oh man, I'm so glad to know I thought I was the only one, and you're not. Use your pain to help other people. Don't waste your hurt. Don't hide your hurt. Let God heal it. Let God recycle it. Let God use it to bless and help others. And number five, I can use my pain to witness to the world. Now, it's interesting. When you start talking about witnessing or evangelism everybody gets uptight everybody the people to whom you're going to witness and that you're trying to evangelize they get uptight they don't want to hear this god stuff and jesus stuff but then the christians get uptight because they're not sure they can do it well and so they get all uptight about sharing it everybody gets uptight about witnessing and evangelism 
that's one thing that believers and non-believers have in common. They both get nervous about evangelism. The fact is, folks, evangelism comes from a Greek word in the Bible, euangelion. And euangelion simply means good news. So witnessing to somebody simply means you're sharing good news with them. Have you ever shared good news with somebody? Have you ever given some good news? Hey, I just had a baby, just had a grandbaby. And hey, I got a promotion, a job. Hey, I got a job. Hey, my car's fixed. Hey, did you ever share any good news? Please say you have. You all are just going like, I ain't never had no good news to share. You've shared good news with people, right? Ten of you. Very. I was counting. I was counting. All witnessing means, all evangelism means is you're sharing the good news about what God is doing in your life with someone else. And the best way to share that is from the perspective of your pain and your suffering. God says your suffering gives you credibility. We think that fame earns respect. And God says what actually earns respect is faithfulness in tough times. What I'm saying is your weaknesses will actually gain a hearing more than your strengths. You think you have to be successful to be heard as a Christian. Maybe you feel like you have to be rich to prove you've been blessed by God and, and then people will listen to you. You have to be famous. That is not true at all. You have to be authentic in your pain. When you're authentic in your pain, then people will listen to you more than you could imagine. Because pain humanizes all of us. It sympathizes. It causes you to have credibility with people. So in your pain, you use that pain to share the good news with other people. Look what Paul said in Philippians 1.12. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped me spread the good news. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Paul says, I use my pain as a model for my message. And God wants you to use your pain as a model for your message, too, as a platform for your life message. God says the, the thing that you regret the most, the thing you wish had never happened in your life, the things that were most painful. He says, I want to use those in your life to touch other people in pain. And that's so true. You know, when I get the best response to my testimony isn't about how many churches I've been able to pastor and how many people I've been able to baptize and all of that. You know when I get the best response? Whether I'm talking collectively to a group this size or I'm talking to one or two people face to face. I get the best response when I tell them that I struggle with depression. I get the best response when I tell them I had to go to the hospital because of it. More than once. That alone is depressing. <laughs> you can laugh. I'm okay with it. When I tell people that, they can identify. They, can identi they cannot identify with Pastor Kevin. Some of you can't even identify with Pastor Kevin because I'm the preacher. I tell you every week, folks, I am one of you. This is my job. It's my calling. I'm just a Christian, just like you. And when I tell people who aren't believers that I struggle with depression, man, they listen. That's what Paul says we do. 
Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 4. In everything we do, we try to show that we are true servants of God. We patiently endure suffering and hardship and trouble of every kind. That, my folks, that's real witnessing. That's Christ-like sharing. The greatest witness of God's love is the suffering of Jesus. When he suffered, he was showing you how much he loves you. Now, the bottom line is this, folks. You're going to have pain in your life. I wish it could stop. But it won't. You can either use that pain for good, or you can waste it. Please don't waste your pain. Today, I want you to ask God to help you find a way to use your pain, your struggles, your difficulties, your challenges. Ask God to help you use it to help others. There's no better time to do this, folks, than at the Christmas season when people are focused on God. At least they will be next Sunday and Monday. Well, next Sunday, usually Christmas Eve. By, by Monday morning, it's all about the gifts. People will listen. Invite them. Will you do that? Because just like you've been through pain, and maybe you're going through it right now, they are too. And everybody who you look at and you say, man, they, they have their life so all together. No, they don't. That may be what you see, but that is not what's all there. Okay. Don't waste your pain this week. Use it. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the series you put us in this past six weeks. Spend some good, encouraging words from your word. And we pray, Lord, as we try to get through what we're going through, we wouldn't deny our pain, Father. You never told us to deny anything. We go through it, and it's hard. The difficulties sometimes, like Paul said, seem overwhelming. Sometimes we feel like we are crushed. But, Father, you can even use those down times, those difficult times. As a matter of fact, Father, your word tells us that you can probably use us better when we go through suffering than in any other way. People can relate to that. So, Lord, what I want to pray is that you would help us never to waste this pain, but to use it just the ways we talked about this morning. But I also want to pray, Lord, this week, you'll put people in our path or you'll bring somebody to our minds that you want us to go to and to share your good news with them even in the very midst of our struggles. Now, Father, one way we can do it is simply to invite them to church next Sunday for Christmas Eve. We're going to have a couple of messages, Father, that I've been praying you will bless, that the believers will just rejoice in, and that those who come who aren't believers will be saved by. So do that, Lord. Make it a great time. And we know, Lord, that we're going to have sufferings and pain and challenges and difficulties way past Christmas. And at any and every time, help us not to waste it, but to use it to draw closer to you, to be closer to others, to help others, to share your good news. Bless our time of response, Lord. It's always amazing to see you work during that time. And I ask those who need to make decisions, and, and um, whether that's a, an internal decision or something that manifests itself externally by coming to the altar to pray or going to the cross, I pray you'll work that out. We give you this time, Lord, bless it. 
In Jesus' name, amen.